Welcome, family, guests, professors, classmates, and if you made it on time, Section A. I can see many of you fanning yourselves in the heat out there, which is always a great sign when you have the longest speech of the afternoon. So let me start by thanking you for the opportunity to speak today. At a school where students have self-selected to be graded on how much they talk, this really is an honor. <laughs> I have something to tell you, though. The thing is, I lied on my HBS essay. In fact, I lied three times. But before you start imagining your friends who should have gotten in, and before my parents sneak out the back, let me explain. The first lie I told was when I talked about the hardest thing I'd ever been through, which I said was being in a wheelchair in high school. See, when I was born, a doctor gave me a contaminated vaccine, which gave me an infection that resulted in my losing most of my left hip. This led to a number of surgeries, stints on crutches, the inability to run or to walk long distances, and finally, two periods in a wheelchair, once in kindergarten and once for the better part of high school. Of course, it wasn't all that bad. After all, I got to watch a ton of movies at home. I'm a big hit with grandparents who share my hip problems. And I got jacked, making me Michelle Obama's original arm inspo. Don't ask her, it's true. However, at the same time, as a very shy kid when I was younger, I also hated having to constantly ask for help, not being able to participate in normal things with my peers like sports and school dances, and most of all, feeling like I didn't have a sense of control over what was happening to me or what I could do about it. However, the real difficult moments were what came after when my wheelchair was parked in the garage. Things like still being shy, still walking funny, and still having to sit, out, sit on the sidelines of activities and ask for help, but with no wheelchair visible to explain to people why I was so different. It was things like tough periods in college, not knowing who to go to or how, and things that I'm sure many of you have experienced, like being the only woman on an all-male team, and no matter how nice they are, always feeling just a little bit left out. You see, I lied because being in a wheelchair was never going to be the hardest thing I've been through. Because when you're in a wheelchair, people can see it. They can see that there's a problem, they can see you're in pain, and they can see that they should offer help. It's barreling down on them on two shiny steel wheels. The real hardest things people face are the ones we can't see the feelings and the fears we don't know how to articulate or how to ask for help with. They're the limitations that make us feel out, that we're left out, that we're embarrassed of, or that we just don't know how to explain, not sure if anyone will understand because they can't see it. At Harvard Business School, we're taught to solve the problems that we can see in our companies and that people bring to us. But to use a little bit of HBS lingo, I think we should build on that. We should look and listen for the problems that can't be seen and try to solve those because they are the ones that will actually make a difference in the world. The good thing is, I've already seen you do this. I've seen you listen and ask questions of your classmates. I've seen you talk about employees whose voices aren't heard and the unintended consequences of big business decisions. I've seen you talk about the lasting, if not always visible, effects of mental illness and sexual assault. I've seen you encourage your veteran classmates to talk about the memories and the scars we can't see, even when they're in uniform. And in one of my section's favorite memories, I've seen you do something as simple as encourage one of the few student moms here to talk about everything going through her head balancing being a business school student and a role model for her daughter, the ups and the downs that we can't see while running around the playground with them. My favorite quote a case protagonist once said was, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. 
The exciting thing for me is that I've seen time and time again how much you care. And while I know there are so many other problems out there, I have faith that after we graduate, you will use what you know from these two years to solve the problems that so many people can't see, but that you are ready and willing to look for. The second lie I told was when I talked about how I couldn't wait to come to Harvard Business School. Because sacrilegious as this may seem now, sorry, Dean, I wasn't even sure I wanted to come. In fact, I didn't decide until the last possible day. See, the thing is, I hadn't really loved college, and no, it's not because I went to Yale. <laughs> but I also loved my job and the people I worked for. While finance isn't exactly known for positive personal transformation stories, for me, the trading floor had become a place where I felt like people finally trusted and believed in me, and where I became less shy and more confident. It became a place where I became more like what I thought an outgoing, energetic leader was supposed to look like. So I was terrified of going back to school and of losing that feeling, of reverting back to be a sh being a shy, funny, walking, unconfident kid again, especially here at HBS, where I expected to be surrounded by the outgoing, overaccomplished, charismatic future leaders of the world, studying the achievements of larger-than-life alumni. But I realized, thinking back to my wheelchair, that the world was going to throw so many things to stop me in my path, and I couldn't let myself be one of those things. So I decided I would go to school. And if I was going to go to school, I would throw myself in. As my favorite quote by Steve Martin said, be so good, they can't ignore you. So I did all the HBS things. I became a section president. I flew a budget airline to Iceland. I even interned at McKinsey. But what surprised me most was not just how much I enjoyed school, but how my perception of a gifted leader changed here. Because in addition to the charismatic outgoing ones, the people I've admired the most have been people like the quiet geniuses in the corner of the classroom who speak infrequently, but when they do, you listen. They've been people like the former bankers who offer their judgment-free time and effort to help their classmates through RC Finance. And they've been people like the students who are so clearly experts in their field, but when you speak to them, they speak so humbly and passionately, they make you feel like you're their peer. My favorite quote has now changed. It's one I read recently in the esteemed business journal, Entertainment Weekly by Lena Waith talking about Steven Spielberg and describing him as a giant who doesn't make other people feel small. I can't imagine a better description of the type of leader I'd like to be. And the thing is, while walking across this campus, I've often felt like I was walking amongst giants and giants to be. But the amazing thing is, you've never made me feel small. The third and final lie I told was when I talked about what I wanted to do after school. A lie to myself as much as anyone else. See, in the most unoriginal move ever for an HBS essay, I said I wanted to stay in finance. Like I said before, I loved my job, my colleagues, and I worked for an amazing boss. But in addition to that, finance was the industry my parents had immigrated from small towns in India and worked for over a decade to break into to give my brother and me the life that led me to be standing here today. And finally, finance, with all its pain and prestige, gave me a safety net and a sense of control I had never had in a childhood wondering when the next medical emergency was going to come and upheave everything. But the thing is, what I've actually always wanted to do is work in the movies. I love how movies and TV have the power to entertain and to bring people together, but moreover, how they change what people see as normal in their world. Whether that's modern family treating a gay couple on TV as typical, films with female superheroes making women leaders seem natural, or children's TV shows with kids of all color making that a normal after-school experience across the country. 
But of course, the movie industry doesn't exactly offer a sense of control or a safety net. And honestly, I thought it sounded a little far-fetched and illogical, if not irresponsible, to say that I wanted to go from Wall Street to Hollywood. And often, one of the hardest things we do is verbalize the thing we're thinking that sounds a little bit out of the ordinary. But then I came here to HBS, and I was lucky enough to find classmates and professors who encouraged me to talk about what I really wanted and dreamed of, and who didn't make me feel dumb for saying so. And at the end of this year, on the cusp of graduation, I faced the decision between going back to my old job or taking a leap into the movie business. And I found myself talking through my future with my friends here, with all of you guys. We talked about it in Aldrich, in SFP, and even the suburban outskirts of the continuum. You talked me through my hopes and my fears, but also understood my concerns and wouldn't judge either path that I might take. But most of all, you taught me not to fear what would happen if I failed, but to dream of who I could be if I succeeded. And that's when I realized I no longer needed my job to be my safety net, because I have a new one, and I've found it in all of you. I've found people here who I can lean on, who will cheer me if I rock it, and who will catch me if I fall. People who've encouraged me to finally get comfortable living life a little bit off script, and who will be a part of the many acts that follow. And that's also why, in a few short months, I'll be packing my bags, catching a flight, and as my muse Miley Cyrus says, hopping off a plane at LAX with a dream and a cardigan. <laughs> because if there's one thing I didn't lie about, it's that I wanted to come here for the people. And that has turned out above and beyond anything I could have imagined. I was lucky enough to find friends I could lean on and classmates whose advice I trust and respect. And it's a pretty amazing thing to have peers you not only care about and have fun with, but you can also learn from and look up to. You found my invisible wheelchair, you made me comfortable amongst giants, and you encouraged me to follow my dreams. I have a long way to go, but you've made me into the kind of person and leader I've always wanted to be by simply making me more comfortable being myself. And there's no better graduation gift you can give someone. We'll all walk out of here with different experiences, memories, and feelings about this place. But for me, this experience has, in fact, been transformational. And the overwhelming feeling I have is one of gratitude for all of you. At HBS, as you know, we have a unique way of showing our gratitude. When parents come to the class, when a professor finishes teaching a course, we stand up for them. Well, luckily I'm already standing up, an ability I don't take lightly. But as we leave this campus and step into a real world full of opportunities and challenges, standing up is going to mean more than physically getting up. It's going to mean rising to the challenge and seizing our ability, our privilege, and our duty to do the things that will actually make a difference in the world. Standing up is going to mean peeking our head over the crowd and looking for the problems that can't be seen and tackling them head on. Standing up is going to mean not only being giants who don't make others feel small, but who pick them up and give them a platform and a voice they never could have imagined before. Standing up is going to mean stepping into each other's paths when they go astray, keeping each other honest, holding each other accountable to the dreams and desires we espouse while here, and encouraging each other, like you did for me, to live life a little bit off script. You should all be so proud of everything you've accomplished while here, and even prouder of how happy you're making the people who've come to watch you. But my hope for you is that graduating from Harvard is not nearly your biggest accomplishment. Because I know you, and I know everything you have to offer the world and to change the worlds of people around you as soon as possible. We often spend our time here reading about CEOs, 
fund managers, founders, and people with big titles who've done big things. But I ask you, don't wait until you have a big title to do the big things. Some of the most important work is going to come from the little choices you make when you're simply in the middle of the pack. It's going to come from the unexpected people you hire, you inspire, you inspire, you give chances to, and you listen to when they weren't the obvious choice. It's going to come from the envelopes you decide to push and the lines you refuse to cross. It's going to come in the little moments that don't make great 15-page case studies, but are all the more important for it because they change what people see in the world as normal. So before you stand up in the boardroom and the C-suite, I ask you to please stand up in the bullpen and the cubicle. Because doing amazing things with the least amazing titles, surprising not only others, but also yourself, even when it means stepping outside the script we've already drafted, that's what it's going to mean to stand up. So before we go off to different cities and different jobs, writing and editing our way through our own personal movies, I encourage you to take a good, hard look at the characters around you. Some characters of whom may run across the pages of every scene going forward. Some who may show up right when you need them after many acts off screen. And some who may, despite our best efforts, simply fade away for the rest of the film. But whatever may come, Look at those characters around you, hold on to that image, and when the time comes that you want to or need to stand up, often in the most rocky and precarious spots of all, when you find that spot, remember the days we all stood up together, remember what you learned from each other and how we grew here together, and remember that by taking the hard stances to make a positive difference in the world, you're making everyone's movie better with you. I, for one, am so glad I had the chance to share the screen with you and to have watched you push my plot forward with such in intellect, integrity, and impact. So, class of 2018, get ready to stand up. Congratulations, and thank you for making me the happiest liar in the world. <laughs>